Well, I'm glad to see that so many are still like uh, up and awake and smiling despite the late time of day. Um, and so what I would like to talk about is, is how we use this interest graph. Um, the interest graph, of course, is, uh, is important to us because it solves this. As Christiana talked about, the first level of the internet was that we put information out there. Uh, the level that we're talking about now is we need to help people find that. It's not because that any of us doubt that the information we're looking for is on the internet at any given time, but it is that we're just inundated with crap, pardon my French, half the time and we would really like someone to do a part of that job for us, which takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, and actually, so I am a technology builder. I have a, a tech startup and I've had some other tech startups before that. And I think that this is the single biggest challenge for people building brands and building products in the future, relevance. Because today, um, we're looking for something that identifies us as uniquely me. It comes with this change of culture where we suddenly want to differentiate ourselves. I mean, in my parents' generation, when they first started going on holiday uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was normal that you went on the place where everyone else went. Oh, let's go to Mallorca, because the neighbor has been to Mallorca, and apparently was really good. And he has these tips, so on Tuesday we have the whole pig, you know, like, and that's at that restaurant. Uh, and here's this brilliant place where the menu is in Danish, fantastic. Today, people would hate that, right? I, I mean, for how many people is that the worst kind of holiday you can think of? Most people, right? Because today, we're, we're totally individuals. I am not defined by a fact that I am a demographic. Of course, I am white, I am female, I'm Danish, I have whatever uh, education level. I'm defined by totally other things. I may see myself as a vegetarian or a technologist or a, a dog lover, and it's all of these things that, that really drive us today. And our job as bringing the communicators who bring products or brands to people is to find out how do we tap into that so people want to talk to us. And the little text on the slide here is not something that you need to read, but it says that there's 350 million websites, 600,000 apps, and then the interesting one, that it takes 26,572 calculations to decide what barbecue sauce to buy in an American supermarket. And that's, of course, a combination of how many brands, how many types, how many sizes, what's the expiration date, and all of that. And we don't want that. We are now at a stage where people would really, really like if you would make their life easy. We've been working on that as an industry for a fairly long time, and this here is a picture of Amazon's recommendation engine. So this engine is considered one of the best ones that's out in the industry today. Um, but actually, if you ask me, there's still a very long way to go. I mean, I would regularly get, I buy a lot of books, so I get a lot of emails that says like, now there's a, dog, you know, how to uh, do a knitting like your grandmother, or uh, how to train your pet kangaroo, or, and I'm thinking like, how the hell did something go that wrong in that diagram that I'm getting stuff about that? Or like the really offensive ones, like, you know, how to lose 20 kilos in two weeks. And it's like, excuse me, like what kind of information are you finding on the internet to send me this? Um, so that is the next step. I think the, what we're in right now is that we have to make stuff easy and we have to make it relevant. The future, the next step, is that we have to learn to predict it. We have to start getting better at, much better at the relationship between two things. If you like this, if you like dogs, you like gardening, you like mountain climbing, then we are going to, in the future, find out the statistical relationship with do you then also like Thai food. But we're not there yet. Where we are is here, where we're starting with the social graph. And the interest graph is not it's not something that's going to replace the social graph, and, and it, this is not like a, a battle of the giants, Twitter versus, uh, versus uh, Facebook. This is the other side. So there's two things that are important when you're building products, and that is relevance and trust. And Facebook and the social graph is very, very good for trust, and so far it's the best one that we have. 
And what we now have to do is, uh, is build the relevance. And as you can see on the little stats, it just says that all the other brands out there are already using social. So certainly if you were thinking of it as a competitive advantage, then that's not a competitive advantage anymore. And you guys in this room all know that getting to status quo means that you're perfectly on par with social. The next step to get ahead is something new. This one here is my company, Everplaces. So we're in the travel space and we're trying to make people's lives better by making sure they spend time in the right places. Uh, this come after I've spent a lot of business meetings with really great opportunities that I've missed because uh, it's super noisy and I can't hear a word of what that guy over there is saying. Or romantic dinners that I've spent in restaurants where they've in their wisdom decided to keep the tables this far from each other so you actually feel more in you, you are easier starting a conversation with a person who sits there than with your partner. And what we kind of recognized was that it's not that a place is good or a place is bad, it's that it's good for certain people and it's good for certain occasions. Um, but we also found out that it wasn't quite that easy to do that. For example, when we first started, we created all these categories where people could say, oh, I would like to save this vegetarian restaurant because I really like it, and then I can write some tips, and it makes it very easy to share with my friends so they can come and find it when they're looking for it. We tend to know that if you have a friend who lives in Berlin, then you would be likely to go into his page when you're going to Berlin and looking for something. But in the beginning, we, went, um, we did the classical mistake, which was that we went too wide. So far, one of the only uh, really wide interest graph networks that have worked is Twitter. A lot of the other ones have had to go much narrower, and we also felt that. So we changed a lot of these categories. For example, sites became culture, because we find out that sites does not appeal to the same kind of person as the word culture does, even though you may be tagging the same things. Because the kind of individualist that work with a, a product like Everplaces, they see themselves way too refined for sites. However, if that monument is culture, then it's a totally different question. We also change music to entertainment, we change makeout to architecture. <laughs> I'm not sure how much relevance there was uh, between those two, but we thought like, oh, we can do something for romantic and be a little bit funny. Well, no one thought that was funny. Uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted us to build something useful. So it was a little bit like, guys, you guys are not dictating the conversation here. You're just building the platform so I can do what I want to do. So just shut up and let me get on with it. We also uh, got rid of some other ones like sports and that was because we could see that most of the people who are using it are people who are interested in design. It's kind of a little bit like the, the hipster personality. I'm not allowed to say that for our marketing people, but it is the people who are interested in good quality. You know, they buy organic food, they like better quality stationery, they would maybe go to some vintage shops, uh, they like good wine. Um, so we found out that sports, does not appeal to this group of people, and we had practically zero places saved in the category sport. Um, I don't know why, uh, th maybe that should mean that maybe those have something to do with the world is getting like larger and larger, but that is someone else's startup's problem, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna stay out of that one. And then we started looking at how much this was actually a trend. So food spotting, which Christiane mentioned before, is this network where you take a picture of a place and then you describe a dish if you really like it and then you share it with strangers essentially all over the world. And if you look really closely, then food spotting has a tagline that says that um, you mark the things inside the place, so not the place itself. Right next to it is a general interest-based network, which is called OINC which says the same things. You rate the things, not the places. The difference in those two, that you rate a dish or you rate a thing, and that is called food spotting, which you know instantly what it means, and it's called oink, where you go, what the hell is that? Means that oink now is dead, and food spotting is doing really strong. Today they have two million users and they're growing really fast. And it's a thing that 99% of humanity will find totally useless and redundant. 
You know, I imagine the startup guy as he pitches this to his mother and he says, and then people sit in a restaurant and they take photos of their food and then they post it out because that breakfast is so interesting that the whole world should be able to see it. Um, and I'm sure she said, like, you've totally lost your mind. But the thing is that they don't cater to the 99%. They cater to the 1%. And that 1% thinks it's fantastic to see those eggs benedicts because they also like it when the yolk is runny. Um, and I think that if you are building a product, then the lessons that's being learned these days is that you have to start really narrow. And then maybe later you can get broad. Pinterest in the beginning had only five categories. Today there's way more. But the thing is that if you want to penetrate, and you guys, a lot of you are in marketing, you know that there's such a battle for attention out there that if you come with something that's too vague, then it doesn't strike someone emotionally and then we don't get through. Then later, perhaps, there's the opportunity to expand it, but it's all about starting. And I think that's also what we found. And, and now it's very much these quality lovers, and it's very much people who are into design that use ever places. And the beautiful thing in that is that now people come and visit us, use us, and they say, like, I, I like it because it's just, it's for people like me. And no one really wants to talk about what we want to talk about. People want us to talk about things that they're already interested in, and they want us to prove a belief that they already had. So that is our job as technology builders and as brands, because we are not going to be allowed to change the topic of conversation. That's just not the way people work. So if you were to do this, and you wanted the, the, some practical steps to how you're doing it, especially perhaps if you have a brand already, then there's some fairly simple steps. So you start by collecting the data and finding out what is it that these people are really interested in. And of course, the old-fashioned way, and sometimes the best way, is, is to ask them. Um, but then, of course, you get this whole thing with people will kind of uh, change their answers depending on what they think you want to hear and depending on how they would like to be perceived. And then, of course, you can just collect it electronically then you have to find out what's important here, and then you have to start finding the patterns and seeing that, okay, you said garden, you said husband, you said dog. Let me guess that your segment and the values of where you are in your life have something to do with family. So if I use the words family, I'm likely to hit you in a place where it matters. And then, of course, you've got to apply the structure and then group the communication. I don't know how many of the newsletters that you guys get that are relevant. I mean, is it under, is it 10%? Is it more than 10% of the newsletters that you get where you think, ah, that was me? It's not very many, right? And that's because there's people out there who have our email addresses and they have our credit card numbers and we already use them and then they talk to everyone as one big mess. But the thing is that we are all very different and all these opportunities we already have some customers if you figure out what it is they want to hear about and then segment it and instead of sending one newsletter, maybe you need to send 20 newsletters but they're different, then instead of just getting the unsubscribe, I mean how many people monitor their unsubscribe level? And you don't have to answer because I know you all do because all good marketing people do. But that many people unsubscribe because we don't manage to talk about something that they already wanted to hear about. So that is the structure and the groups. And really, at that level, it's something that every organization can do already today. It takes a lot of effort, but you'll also get a lot of good feedback from it. I love, <laughs> for example, when my phone company managed to say something relevant instead of saying, oh, now there's a discount on pay as you go. It's like, bloody hell, I've had like a business subscription for three years. Are you totally retarded? Like, you have my account details. Why are you sending me this kind of crap? Before, I didn't think about you. Now I think you're a retard. I mean, that is not in your interest. <laughs> um... The thing that we had to fi find out when we started doing this and we started working with the interest graph is that how do we get people to find us? Because for a very long time, or at least five or ten years, it's been ingrained in us that the way to get the word out is using the sociograph. You put like buttons on and you do invite your friends and well, guess what? Uh, people don't invite their friends anymore. Because there's so many things that you can invite your friends to that in order to do that, it has to be really exceptional. And there's also a lot of companies uh, of, of 
our kind that are spamming stuff onto people's uh, profiles and therefore people have totally lost trust in the whole industry. So now whether or not we're the fault of it, because I think it's crap and we would never do that, but it doesn't mean that I don't still have to pay for it because people will not allow us to connect into their social networks anymore. So now we have to find them or let them find us through other ways. And one thing is through influencers and experts. It lies in the nature of something that's shared by interest is something that's spread by interest. Another one is blogs, media, interest-based networks, and this is where Pinterest is so, uh, so strong, right? Because it turns out that there is a correlation between people who are really into surfing are also much more likely to be into mountain biking than people who like baking cakes. So these are the avenues where we now have to understand. We have to go out and see, well, what are all these blogs and what are all these media and what are all these things that talk to the people that I want to talk to? And in the old days, we just used to be able to get in the paper and then people would have seen it. But now we're not communicating with our local audience. We're communicating with interest-based audience all over the world, which means that that doesn't really work anymore. And then we still have some level of, uh, of social, and this is these friends with the same interest. And the beauty is that if you have people where you both have like a correlation between the interest graph and the social graph, then that's super strong. And then people are really willing to share because it helps them. People don't want to post anything that they think perhaps could be irritating to their friends because this is their identity. The internet is very much about getting, being perceived how we want to be perceived. And more than anything, the interest graph is about aspirations. The social graph was very much about who I am. Where do I go to school? Where do I work? It's very factual and it doesn't give a lot of room for like imagination. The interest graph is about who people want to be. It's like what do they aspire to and they'll follow networks on BMWs even though they could never afford it or they'll uh, follow groups on mountain climbing even though they're still 50 kilos overweight and it is very much uh, about passions and that's a tremendous opportunity for us right because then we can hit people where they care if you look at how it's worked for us then uh, our three biggest market and ever places is in order is the US then Germany and then Brazil and we can actually see that it's these three things that are working in the US, we've gotten a lot of media exposure, and that seems to be working quite well. Uh, in Germany, we're getting a lot of mentions in very specific, like vegetarian blogs, for example. These blogs work better than anything else. Like uh, a mention on a small blog on um, design shops or someone who writes about vintage stuff will have way more effect than getting in the New York Times. And it takes uh, quite a lot of work, right? Because then you got to find these blogs and you got to make sure that they know who you are. But also because you become interesting, because you're specific to their niche, then a lot of people find you. And uh, generally, we don't do a lot of approaches to the, to the media. We talk to a couple of the very big blogs, but otherwise most people actually find us. And we get bizarre ones, like the other day we got one in, in Latvia, and I think so far now we've had coverage in 21 countries. And, and we're not sitting and contacting that, like we're a company of seven people, so we don't even have a PR department. Um, then the third one, which actually is my favorite, is in Brazil, where the social atmosphere is, is really strong and people are sharing a lot. So in Brazil, we have absolutely no idea why it works. Somehow, people in Brazil just seem to like it and are user-based their growth. I've never been to Brazil. I don't speak Portuguese. We can barely read half the messages that come back, but for some reason it works in Brazil. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that. I can, I can definitely live with that. But what we did find out when we had to spike these, and this is a very hands-on tool that everyone can use, is that we work with these influencers. So it's an old marketing trick that you find out who's the most influential in your area. You can either do it on CloudScore or Twitter followers or something like that. And then you try to see how you can get to talk to them. Um, for example, um, there was a design agency or a design game agency that wanted to hire great people, but they didn't have the kind of budget as all the other ones had. 
So then they find out who was the 10 people that we really want to work for us in the States. And they did a lot of time researching, finding out what those people care about. And then they sent something specifically to them. They sent like a babushka doll. And then when you came to the last letter, there was a little iPod. And on that iPod was a message from the CEO saying, you're in our absolutely would die to have list. We love your stuff. And that stuff, instead of trying to get out to 10,000, trying to get to the 100, was super effective. And in their case, I think 28 of those eight people managed joined, just because they had never been wooed like that in their whole lives. And we've been a little bit lucky to be able to get some of that same response. So we have some people that, that really help us, and these are not people that I pay. Most of them I've never seen, I don't know who they are, but we have three people who've actually volunteered as travel writing interns. They just sit and find cool stuff and curators and help us make sure that there's nice stuff for social media. And so, so these are just people who really love travel and who really love technology. And they spend 10 to 15 hours a week for free because we are selling the dream they have. I, I, you can't pay people to give that. It's just because they have an idea of the world and we are trying to make that dream true. And then they want to team up. And then we have 54 ambassadors in 21 countries. So these are people that just talk about it and they write a lot of stuff and they go out and talk to their friends and they convert their people. And again, most of these people we don't know. And, uh, because we're not trying to be the big corporate, then people, people know we really appreciate it and we really do and we talk to them as, as totally normal people and when they're in Copenhagen, they come and visit us. And then we have some featured users and then we have some normal users, but almost all of the energy that we spend go on to the top ones because the top ones are our engine for growth. And um, that's an interesting point, I think, looking at some few ones that are very powerful as opposed to the other ones. And the last thing I want to say before I stop is, is this going back to this thing of, of that being aspirational. Because what we found is that people want a product in the interest graph to be enabling. They want to unlock their creative powers and they want you to be a platform because we can't dictate stuff anymore. And Converse, for example, saw it really well when they did this campaign where you can design your own shoe. There's like millions of people around the world who wanted to be shoe designers, but they could never get that job. And they're totally passionate about that. And you can even see a future where then you can sell that shoe that you designed on your blog and your website, and you can get the credit for it. And people want to organize, and they want to curate, and they want to make it themselves, because this is the, they're trying to build the image of who they want to be and then they're using your platform to do it. And I think that's a really beautiful quest. So I'm going to end with that. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, I just want to ask you a little question because I'm interested to hear how specialized do people want it? Do they want to ask for a cupcake in New York or noodles in Bangkok? Is, is that how specialized? People yeah, I think they want as specialized as they can get. Um, sometimes you can't deliver it right, and generally people will want like either cheap food in Shanghai or high quality stuff, and, and that tends to work. But I'm sure that we're going towards a cupcake level, but uh, I don't know if there's m many companies on the internet that are quite ready for that yet, but we're working on it. Thank you very much, Tina. Thank you.